practitioners, everybody is in love with glutathione and people suggest that everybody needs glutathione, but the question is who needs it and who doesn't, which leads us to laboratory testing. Today, we're going to look at the accuracy of an organic acid metabolite that looks at glutathione deficiency and whether or not we should be using it in practice. All right, so we're going to look at uh, urinary organic acid testing to look for glutathione need. Okay, now everybody says that we need glutathione today, but really we need to find out who actually needs it. So the urinary organic acid test, if you're familiar with it, there's a number of different labs that offer it, but you can see the theme here. There's a marker called, it's called 5-oxyproline or pyroglutamic acid or pyroglutamate. This is just examples from different labs that offer it and kind of how they show you, but it's the same thing. It's this marker called pyroglutamic acid or pyroglutamate. Why is that a marker of glutathione deficiency? Supposedly, well, and notice it says glutathione. Now, here's glutathione recycling cycles. There's a couple of them here, so I could show it to you real quickly. But glutathione is essentially a tripeptide. It's made up of three amino acids. It's glutamate or a glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine. And you can see those here. Here's glycine, here's cysteine, here's glutamic acid. Now, when those three things come together, you get glutathione. And over here, you can see glutamic acid. Cysteine is added here. Glycine is added at the end. And then you get glutathione. Now, why is 5-oxyproline or pyroglutam pyroglutamic acid or pyroglutamate a marker of supposedly glutathione deficiency. Well, you can see it here. So here's basically the way that this works. If there's some issue with the synthesis of glutathione, then this is going to tend to build up. So let's look at this one here. So the cycle's going this way. If we blocked glycine for some reason and you could not make glutathione, then what happens is this whole cycle, this starts to get backed up. And if this gets backed up because it can't move forward because you're lacking the last piece to, on the conveyor belt in order to make this thing glutathione, then everything else in behind it's going to back up, including 5-oxyproline, which is also known as pyroglutamate or pyroglutamic acid. So higher levels of pyroglutamate suggest, according to these labs, low glutathione. Now, you could have low glycine, you could have low cysteine. Theoretically, if it's getting used up, maybe, then you might have a higher glutathione need, but... It's mostly if this pathway gets blocked, okay, and we're going to see that. So same thing here. If you lack glycine, then this is going to tend to build up, spill out into the urine, and that's what they're looking at. Here's an older paper called Urinary Excretion of 5-Oxyproline, or Pyroglutamic Acid, as an Index of Glycine Insufficiency in Normal Man. Now, what they did is they took a small handful of men, and they gave them something called sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate, I have a graphic I'll show you in a second, Binds on to glycine, it's a drug, binds on to glycine, produces hypuric acid or hypurate, and it gets excreted in the urine. It's a, it's a, it, it picks up the glycine essentially in the serum uh, and temporarily depletes it. Now it's used pharmaceutically for various uh, conditions, but here's what it is. So sodium benzoate, just so you can see, it binds on to glycine. It's showing you here in the mitochondrial matrix, but then it shows up as this hypurate. Now, here's what this paper did. Now, there's a couple really interesting things about this. We've got to pay attention. So they gave four grams of sodium benzoate, and here's what happened. So in this particular chart here we're going to look at, um, you can see that at hour zero, here's their baseline of 5-oxyproline or pyroglutamic acid, and various degrees or amounts of it, that's fine. In each one of these three cases, after two hours, it went up. Okay, that's great. So then that's showing that glycine sort of disappeared, and then therefore their pyroglutamic acid went up. But what I want you to notice also is that hour four, this person's came right back to baseline. This person is headed back to baseline after six hours. This person's taken a little longer. Now, over here in uh, table B or, or part B, these were what they considered to be non-responders to four grams of sodium benzoate. This person had a really low pyroglutamic acid in the first place. It did go up, and then, but again, started to come back down after about six hours, almost to baseline. These people, for whatever reason, this X and this O here, didn't even hardly budge, but then it kind of went down afterwards. Now, I want you to think, why would that be? Over here, down at this bottom one, when the four grams didn't work, they bumped it up and they gave him 10 grams. So 10 grams in this person definitely worked. And you can see, but then it started to come back down. This person, this X, didn't have any, they don't respond to sodium benzoate for some reason. And then this person here, again, a response, but quite a bit later. But notice that it ends up coming back down to baseline after a number of hours. Now, think about this, and I'm not going to go into great detail as to why, we can make glycine. The body can produce it endogenously from other amino acids like serine. So if our glycine pool gets sucked out really quickly, then we have the ability to regenerate that. Now pay attention to that for this uh, an upcoming study. This particular study very briefly looked at vegetarians and showed that in fact vegetarians tended 
to have uh, higher 5-oxyproline levels than did omnivores. The researchers suspected that maybe it had to do with amino acid intake, things like glycine. That would make sense. So that's kind of interesting. This particular paper looked at pyroglutamic acid, looking at it as a prognostic indicator for people that had an infection. Now, in this case, they used septic patients. That's not a suspected infection. That's a kind of a big one. But they showed that urinary pyroglutamic acid concentration was not associated with worse, worse outcomes among septic patients. And one would think that if you had an infection, especially sepsis, that perhaps your glutathione uh, would go down, maybe being used up for oxidative stress. But in fact, it didn't, it didn't really uh, amount to much. But here's the big problem. Now, this was a paper that was published a while ago. Uh, this guy used to own a lab that uh, did organic acid testing. They used people, and they tracked it, if you look at the title, long-term patterns. Four weeks, they tested healthy individuals' pyroglutamic acid levels. And what I want to show you is very interesting here, that there were some people that had, over the course of four weeks, a pretty tight, uh, consistent sort of trait-like effect of pyroglutamate, and therefore maybe glycine. Some of these went up above a little bit, but I want you to show as quickly as it goes up, and then it comes right back down. In each one of these cases, it doesn't go up and stays up. It goes up and comes right back down. Now, in the high-variant subjects, of which there were nine, you can see that, in, oddly, in every one of these cases, these ones, they started high and it went down. And then after it went down to a certain level, and you can see that somewhat here too, goes up. Okay, There's a lot of variance in this. There's a lot of, of movement. This person clearly had a lot. So first of all, there's, there is variance with this marker in certain people. In some people, there doesn't seem to be. In other people, there does. Now, what the suggestion was with this paper was, was when the pyroglutamic acid was above, and they just did the cut off as around 40 micrograms, um, micrograms per milligram, is that when it got up to a certain level, it went down almost as a feedback cycle. That when your 5-oxyproline goes up, your glycine is theoretically low, then maybe your body ramps up glycine production in order to, because your tank's getting a little bit low. So when it's high, that's why it comes back down. But notice when it comes back down, in a lot of these cases, it goes down, but then jumps back up again. So maybe, in a sense, the body is making glycine reserves, and you're having enough glutathione, and then all of a sudden, it maybe kind of overdoes it, and it jumps back up. The point being is that, number one, there is seems to be some cycle in the body where it regulates this to some degree. Also, because you can see here, there is some degree of variability with this. So this is my words, not the paper. There is potential for significant variance in this marker. And the question becomes, what other markers have this much variance in an organic acid test impacting our therapeutic interventions? While I'm on this marker of glutathione and the organic acid test, you've probably heard people saying that uh, in this industry that autoimmunity, if anybody has that, you have to have glutathione. Just, you must have it. Everybody drastically needs glutathione if you have an autoimmune condition. This paper looked at prediction of autoimmune diseases using organic acid metabolites. Fantastic. Well, let's take a quick look at this. We're not going to look at all the other markers, but specifically, we're interested in pyroglutamic acid as a marker of uh, glutathione need, according to these labs and experts. But when I take a look at this, first of all, uh, there's not a lot of difference. The, the median is 21, uh, and over here it's 16. And then when you look at the mean of 19 and 23, there's not a whole lot. Statistically, they said it was significant, but I'll tell you clinically, that's not very different. That's just a, a matter of a few points. But here's what's really interesting. Remember, elevated pyroglutamic acid is associated with low glycine and supposedly a glutathione need. But here, the control has a slightly higher pyroglutamic acid than do the autoimmune patients. And if these experts were right, suggesting that all autoimmune people need, our patients need glutathione, you'd expect this to be higher. Or if pyroglutamic acid was in fact a good marker for glutathione status, which perhaps it's not, you'd expect this to be higher. Whichever way you look at this thing, um, something doesn't add up. Anyhow, urinary pyroglutamic acid, it is a potential marker of glycine as far as I'm concerned, and thus maybe glutathione deficiency, although that's difficult to actually say. It's not a one-to-one one -one marker. Um, there are potential fluctuations and variants. There does seem to be some kind of feedback feedforward system. And so therefore, I give it a grade of C. It's not a totally a waste. Um, there is some clinical utility to it. However, as with the case of some other markers we've looked at, multiple samples over a period of time from days to weeks would give you a better idea of what was actually going on with somebody rather than what could potentially be these, these huge fluctuations. 
But that's just how I read the evidence. I'd love to hear what you think. And when you're done with that, head over to Clinician's Code, where we have these kind of conversations and a lot more while we help practitioners build confidence, cut overwhelm, and become more successful in functional medicine.